Sure, right. of course. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Helping First Generation Students Succeed workshop. Um, Dr. Lynn Wynn and myself are very happy to have you all online today to talk about this, these important topics. And my name is Dr. Yvonne Johnson, and I work with all different modalities of teaching and learning, um, instructional development, multimedia, all kinds of different um, aspects and different modalities and delivery schedules for teaching and learning. And I also teach doctoral level um, research courses for the College of Health and Human Sciences. And I will turn the um, microphone to my colleague, Dr. Lynn Wynn. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lynn Wynn, and I am an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning here at NIU. And although I'm fairly new to the faculty development field, I have over a decade of teaching experience in higher education um, here at NIU and at, at the institution as well. So uh, <clears throat> today, welcome everyone um, for being here to join us for this workshop on helping first generation students succeed. So the demographic of our incoming um, student will be shared later, but the majority of our student are first generation college student, um, which mean they did not have our either of their parent or guardian um, has a bachelor degree. So today we will be talking about instructional techniques that you can use to support first generation college student um, in your courses. <clears throat> so um, first, um, I think here, I just want to have everybody introduce yourself really quickly um, just in the chat. Uh, or you can unmute yourself and share your name, your pronouns, if you use one and comfortable sharing and your department. And um, if you're comfortable, um, will you, are you identify yourself a first generation student? Well, I can start um, since sure. we've already, I, I've already introduced myself to the two of you. I'm Lori Lawson. I am not a first generation student. I'm a first graduate school uh, generation student, but I work a great deal with freshman students and developmental writers, most of whom are first generation students. And so I want to learn as much as I can about that. I'm in the Department of English. Thank you, Lori. Is he, let me check the chat. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuan Tian, uh, assistant professor in finance department. I'm not a first generation student, uh, so I want to learn how to improve the uh, learning experience for the first generation students. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Yuan Tian, and thank you for being here. All right, so if you would like to share your name department and whether you're a first-gen student, I will continue to check the chat. I see um, people continue to type in the chat to introduce yourself. That's perfectly fine. So I will stop and um, go back to the chat periodically to, um, to see who else joining us here. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, <clears throat> so um, do you have any experience teaching first-gen college students? And if so, um, can you share with the group? 
and you don't have to share. We can go through these really quick. I just want to check. Let's see. So I have Temi. Hi, I am Temi from Curriculum and Instruction Department, and you work with many first generation students. Wonderful. Welcome, Temi. Thank you. Yeah. Do you, so do you just share that you work with many first generation students? What was it like? Like, is there one thing that stand out that you want to share with the group? Um, I, I currently work with a lot of them too, because I'm working with a group that we have um, from the Elgin Community College that we have a partnership with. And um, they, I feel like they take more ownership and they work extremely hard to, they work more independently and really want to do well for their families. They really are very, they're proud of themselves and very independent. And I usually have less um, hand holding with, you know, the their young students that come in and they're very proud of who they are. And, um, and and that they're they're starting the college, you know, at their in their in their households and their family. So I, I love working with them. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I am a first generation um, college student, and although I struggle with a lot, I I do resonate with the the grit, the determination, and and the resilience. Like I have to make it, I have to make it so that other people, uh, my younger sibling, can make it too. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Lori, you had mentioned that you also work with first gen student. I uh, yes, I I need to be careful not to conflate developmental with first generation. Um, although I think they both have taught me that you need to make everything explicit. You um, if you're not careful, you'll be assuming that a lot of things are understood that are not actually understood. For example, students don't know that finals occur the last week after classes end. And unless you tell them that, they are making holiday and family plans to leave the last day of class, and they're quite shocked. Um, so I have found that making everything as explicit as you possibly can, explaining what finals week is, um, how you check your final exam, um, making sure that students know how to log into their email, making sure that students know how to access the Blackboard, that they know how to submit a paper online, so that just for every single thing that they need to do, be aware that they might not know what that is or how to do it or where to find it. And, um, be as explicit about that as possible because it helps everybody, not just the people who are don't know what to ask. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that. And <clears throat> for the newer faculty who join us today, so these workshop a lot of the time are us creating a learning community so that you can learn from other faculty who have experience, say in this case, teaching first generation, right? Because everything that Temi and Lori just share with us is very valuable information. And we will uh, mention some of it but thank you so much for sharing your experience. So this is a quick agenda for what we, um, Ivana and I are gonna be covering today. So we're gonna first talk a little bit more about the characteristic of first-generation student. Both Timmy and Lori already point out a lot of the, those characteristics that we're gonna repeat. Um, and then we're gonna go over what is NIU, incoming freshman class for the class 2024, 2025, what are some common challenges that first generation student face and what is your role a faculty in supporting first generation student success. We will also provide you some evident based strategies that um, we could use to support generate first generation student and um, I believe Yvonne gonna put some focus on how a growth mindset can really help students succeed and then we will share with, with you some resources that you can use and share with your student and last thing is reflection Q&A question and answer and wrap up 
So um, first thing first, um, characteristic of first generation student. Um, first generation student as a diverse group of people. So they represent a microcosm of society. So then no monolithic description of first generation student other than the fact that neither of the parent or guardian complete a bachelor degree. So they don't necessarily have a quick access to advice or information from people closest to them about how to navigate college. So today we will talk about different issues that impact first generation students and techniques that we can use to, to support them. So despite challenges, first generation students, as Temi noticed, um, many of them can and will achieve academic success if we provide the support or services or, or simply just understand and, and don't get in their way. So I want to uh, remind you and introduce you to some uh, of the incredible first generation students, um, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, um, she served on the U.S. Supreme Court, Senator Elizabeth Warren, First Lady Michelle Obama, uh, Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, and Ruth Simons, um, the 18th president of Brown University. All of these incredible people are first generation college graduate, and they go on and change the world, right? I, I also want to to uh, um, introduce you to some of the homegrown first generation uh, college graduate right here on NIU campus. So NIU have this website um, that celebrating the success story of many first generation students. And I'm going to pick on this guy, Professor Ralph Wheeler, because he my husband, um, he's from the chemistry department, and he's white, gender, heterosexual men in STEM. So he has many pr privilege. However, um, as a first gen college student from a financially disadvantaged background, he also faced a lot of challenges. Um, so his story is public, and you can um, we will share the the link. To I mean, we will share the PowerPoint slide so you can go and check out this story for your, yourself. But um, he basically, when he were in undergraduate on Friday, he would eat as much as he can and take a few things back to his room. And then over the weekend, he basically starved himself because he couldn't afford to eat. And we have students who face challenges like that. Um, or, or he would save uh, plastic forks and spoons so he wouldn't have to buy utensil or he would eat out of old margarine containers so he wouldn't have to buy dishes. And this is how he and I connect because I did exactly the same thing to save money. Um, so now today he's a full professor. He was the chemistry professor, um, department chair. And when we first got here in 2016, he bought in a million dollar in it with the STEM grant which provide merit-based scholarship for, for STEM student. And he just got that grand renew, um, and this time for $2 million. And the majority of that money going to be um, providing scholarship for our STEM student, um, regardless of uh, background and experiences. It's a merit-based scholarship. So um, with that said, I want to share something um, different about the motivation um, to attend college. And this, um, these bullet points, I compiled them from a lot of study that were done. Um, and uh, we will share that in the um, resources for you as well, if you want to read more on it. So first generation student motivation to attend and persist in college often different from those of their continuing generation peer. So um, this slide provides a very brief compare and contrast of different motivation that drive first generation 
um, and continuing generation college student to attend college. So first thing is social mobility. And I think Tammy mentioned this. So many first generation students, they see college as um, a path towards social mobility. Uh, they often view education as a mean to break the cycle of poverty or economic hardship and provide a better life for themselves and their family. Why a career stability is also important for continuing generation student, um, <clears throat> they are maybe more motivated by opportunity for career advancement, prestige, and personal fulfillment. Um, <clears throat> and speaking of which, I pursue chemistry because of very similar reason. I need to have a stable career that, that will pay the bill. So for first generation um, student, <clears throat> there's a strong focus on achieving stable and well-paying career, often in convocational oriented field, um, usually perceived as secure, like in healthcare, engineering, engineering and business. They are less likely to pursue humanity, fine arts, um, meanwhile, for continuing generation student with more exposure to higher education and a broader social network and social support, these students might be more inclined to explore various academic interests and career paths, including those that align with their personal passion rather than purely economic factor, right? I love poetry but my parents and my family never want me to become a, a poor writer. It was just like unthinkable. And that's why hardcore science and, and a solid career in the STEM field was what my parents wanted for me. I never get to pursue my passion for writing and, and poetry. Um, Last thing here is the, the spirit, the pioneering spirit. First generation students are trailblazers in their community and set an example for the sibling or younger relative or sometimes just like younger neighbors in a community. So why some continuing generation students may feel motivated by the desire to uphold family tradition or expectation, continuing the legacy of higher education within their family, um, their motivation for first generation is very different. So these different expectations come with different stress and anxiety, but they also provide the determination and the drive for each group to persist in college. So who are our incoming uh, freshman class? Um, according to the 10-day count report, which um, was sent in our NIU um, daily mail, the 2024 <clears throat> incoming freshman class continue to be a very diverse uh, and very accomplished. And I'm sorry, my lights go off, so I'm going to try to turn it back on. Um, so nearly 2,000 freshmen um, enroll with 50% identifying a first generation college student and 66% a student of color. Um, this highlight NIU commitment to diversity and inclusion. Academically, these students bring in an average GPA of 3.39. Um, it's the third highest on the record for NIU with 36% achieving GPA of 3.7 or higher. And IU also saw a more, more than 10% increase in new transfer students compared to the fall 2023. And these students um, overall, they were awarded over $6.3 million in merit scholarship. So um, I, I just want to point out that the characteristic of first generation do not just exist in isolation, right? The first generation label is interconnected with their other social differences, such as race, ethnic city, religion, um, disability, nationality, citizenship, gender, and sexual orientation. So it's important to consider these differences along with the fact that they are first generation students. 
So what are some of the challenges first generation students face? <clears throat> Um, so there's a lot of challenges, but I pick out the two things that I think, um, in most important, and they are the different in parental engagement and educational experiences. So upon making the decision to attend college, many first generation students already feel disconnected or misunderstood by their family and community. And the difference between the goal and life path of their parents and first generation students can cause a feeling um, of being unsupported. And um, those can have consequences to their education attainment. Um, there's a list of empirical study to back up this claim, but I can also tell you an anecdote about my experience. So I, um, when I attend graduate school, when I get into the PhD program to pursue a PhD in computational chemistry, um, my mom was freaking out. Like she was so worried in her mind and in our family tradition, she much rather that I get married and start having kids. So she was worrying that um, I would be too old and too educated for a nice man to marry me. Um, so she was not entirely supportive um, or understand why I want to pursue a PhD. To her, it's with too much education. It's not a place for a woman. Um, so any moment when I face challenges in various time during my PhD, um, my graduate school, pursuing a PhD, it's really challenging to come to her for help because every time she was like, just stop, just quit, like just, just give it up. You don't have to have a PhD, you already have a college degree. So I didn't get that kind of support that I need um, to graduate school. And so that was my personal experience. But the study also showed that parental involvement in education has shown to improve student educational aspiration and, and reduce a lot of the shock of transitioning into um, college life. So continuing generation often receive more parental support. They have a safety net from their parent support, both financially and in terms of guidance. So this allow continuing generation to take more risks in their educational choice. Um, another challenge is the lack of cultural capital. So first generation students may lack the cultural capital that continuing generation students have, um, such as familiarity with college culture, knowledge of available resources, or understand of how to navigate the academic system. And Lori mentioned this. Like first generation student, um, we don't know. So a lot of things that's so obvious and, and apparent to you, but is we it may not be apparent to first generation college like me. So um it's is an excellent practice that you do, Lori, to spell out everything for your student. Um that's certainly super helpful. So in contrast, the continuing generation, um, they may feel the pressure to meet or exceed the educational um, achievement of their parents, uh, which can drive them to pursue um, advanced degrees or prestigious institution. So this could, can be a good thing. And um, Educational and cultural differences uh, between first generation uh, and continuing generation. So first generation students are more likely than their continuing um, generation here to attend lower performing school and take less challenging courses while in high school. So they often are less prepared and may have a lot more growth to go in their connect. Um, cognitive skill um, and study habit. Um, 
Additionally, continuing generation students uh, frequently also have the network advantages, um, having access to family network and connection can provide these students with internship opportunity, mentorship, career advance, influencing their mo motivation toward building professional and social capital. So those are something um, to keep in mind. Um, also, other challenges are financial um, support limitation uh, for first generation student. And because they lack of the cultural capital, they, they have lower usage of campus resources. And I can speak from my own experience. I had no idea that all the student services out there, the tutoring center, the writing center, the advising center, the student health center, I had no idea that my tuition and fee already paid for those services. I didn't use any of them. When I were in undergraduate and graduate school, I did everything by myself. I struggled, but I didn't know that I could get help and I didn't seek out um, to get help. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, sorry, I was supposed to um, skip the previous slide, but, uh, but I forgot. Oh, OK, so. Um, one thing I want to point out is the journey of first generation student to a four year institution alone is a testament to their tenacity and preservation, right? They have to overcome numerous financial, emotional, and academic obstacles to reach this point. So um, they deserve respect for their strength and, and resilience. Um, but uh, <clears throat> But yeah, despite all of that, the reality is they disproportionately come from lower income family and lack of access to financial capital and, and information. Um, they also, most of the first generation, and this, this is the finding from a couple of study, first generation students are more likely to be responsible to finance their own education. So the cost of material and other expenses can create tremendous stress that is completely unrelated to their ability to learn, right? Um, and then the cultural capital, the first generation lack of cultural capital, we said it before, but I mentioned it again. So it's very challenging for them to understand how to navigate academic system. Um, this lack can also make them, um, uh, sometimes it can make them mo more motivated and, and leverage the skill to succeed so they become more resilient. But if you can help along the way by spelling out everything, that would be fantastic. Right? Um, educational and cultural difference. So first generation students are more likely to attend lower performing school. Um, I mentioned that earlier. Um, one thing is the studying habit. Many um, students, especially for Jen like me, I don't have good study habit. I didn't know how to study. And so um, if you could help your student with those things, that would be extremely helpful. Um, <clears throat> And then lower uses of campus resources. Like I said earlier, the lack of cultural capital often result in lower usage of campus resources because we don't know. Um, lack of parental engagement. So um, I mentioned this earlier, right? Um, when the, the goal and the life paths of the parent and the first generation um, are so different, there's a disconnection there. Um, and so they would not receive the parental involvement that their um, continuing generational peer would receive. Um, and, um, and they lack not only the financial support, but the guidance as well. Um, so that's something for us to be aware. Last thing I want to talk about 
um, challenges a first generation student face a significant disparity in their interaction with faculty, uh, both in and outside the classroom. And this particularly evident when comparing to their continuing generation peers. Um, when result, um, when they don't interact with faculty or um, for um, various reasons, the result is the feeling of isolation and lack of support, and that can intensify the feeling of anxiety and hinder participation in class. So, um, and I, I suffered this. I didn't know I could go to office hour. I didn't know I could like set up an appointment and meet my professor. Um, the culture where I come from, the relationship between professor and student is so far apart. Um, so I, I didn't understand and I didn't know how to navigate that relationship. Um, we should also show that first generation student tend to study fewer hours compared to their peer because we don't know. Um, we don't have good studying habit. We don't know what it take. Um, and additionally, um, first gen students study habit are often less effective. They are typically um, um, studying by themselves or studying alone. Why are the student more likely to combine um, study with a body, with a group? Um, and so the, the, that practice can studying in a group that practice can enhance learning outcome and first gen student um, are typically study alone by themselves. Um, so with all of that background information, I'm going to hand it over to Yvonne to talk to you a little bit about the role as faculty and how you can support this student. Great, thank you very much, Lynn, for sharing all of that important information. And I am a first generation student as well. Neither one of my parents have bachelor's degrees and an experience that I had as a young child, I was in elementary school and there were seven children in my family. And when my youngest sister started school, both of my parents went to the high school at night after my dad had worked all day and commuted um, over an hour each way to work. They, both my mom and my dad, went to the high school to complete their general education um, degree requirements because they were from the generation when high school wasn't even an option for um, like going all the way through high school was not even an option in their small um, community that was mostly a farming community. And so I saw the uh, family value of education, didn't have the cultural capital to be able to, they didn't have the cultural capital to be able to help us to understand higher education and things, but we definitely saw the value of their um, of education in our family. And in thinking about teaching first generation students, it's important to realize the powerful impact that each of you have, that each of us has on first generation students. We're role models. We can share that intellectual capital and information about resources. One of the things that is really important to try to remember is that we've been working in higher education for a number of years. And some of the things that we, we don't even think about anymore, try to remember what it was like if your first day on campus, or you know, if you were a first generation student or not, but your first exposure to something that's brand new that you have no experience with, and how did you navigate that? And as a faculty member and instructor, you can help to illuminate that unfamiliar ground for your students. And Lori talked about how to be explicit and those are excellent techniques. And I think one way to think about is, is making the invisible visible. So 
be explicit in your directions and, and realize the significant impact that you have as, um, you know, the instructor in that classroom. They, they look up to you. They model your behavior. Um, that's how I learned a lot of things as a first-generation student was watching how faculty instructors and other students behaved and then um, took some of those similar actions. So don't diminish the, the impact, like don't, don't diminish how much you think your impact is on students because it is really significant and um, you can really make a huge positive difference and we appreciate you, your efforts to do that. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about a few different strategies that you can use to support first generation students. Thank you. One of the aspects of coming to a new campus and you know there's this this large community with all of these buildings and and I'm walking on this campus as a first generation student and and it could be intimidating and we want to make sure that we create a a culture of of community and inclusiveness and belonging um, on the campus and in our classes because that's what's going to keep students coming back and as a first generation student i remember going to my my first classes, my first semester, and I didn't uh, get my bachelor's at um, NIU. I got it at a different school. But every one of my classes for basically the first two years of school had at least 200 students and 300 uh, and more. And so I kind of, you know, walked in those classes and I thought, wow, you know, this is kind of intimidating. Um, and at that time, um, there, there wasn't as much um, focus on bringing students into the conversation. And so literally, we were numbers on the wall. They used to post our grades on the wall. Um, and this is showing some dating here, but with social security numbers on the wall. That's how, you know, so what I did to help myself to kind of make it a smaller community was I sat in like the first few rows of the classroom. So even though there was, you know, auditoriums behind me, I would sit in the first few rows. So it seemed like a more um, small class. Um, so that was one technique and um, it helped me as a student to feel like I had a sense of belonging in the class. Um, next slide, please, Lynn. For you as an instructor and uh, faculty member, you want to extend that belonging and create that sense of connection with your students because we know that, um, you know, the first semester is, it's really hard to navigate. I taught um, UNIV 101 a number of times and that's a class for brand new freshmen and Thinking back, um, you know, they they would get lost coming to class because they're not familiar with with the campus, with the environment, and things like that. And so, no matter what time they arrived, you know, I'd say, "Oh, great! You know, you found the classroom, and um, you know, come on in, and you know, learn their names. Use name tense. Use different ways if you're teaching online or hybrid. Use different ways to be able to call them by name because it." It makes them to feel that they're valued. And Lynn had talked about how they could feel excluded or invisible. So we want to make them feel seen and that their voice is valued. Um, so using their name, learning their names, and you can ask them to complete their Blackboard profiles. And if they choose, they could add a a, a picture if they choose they could add their pronouns and they can share as much as they want or as little but it can help everything that you do to create the humanizing aspects of your class is going to help to build that connection and um, community and belonging in your class and 
I worked really hard at that with, I work really hard at that with my, my students, whether they're UNIV 101 or the advanced doctoral students. And I see that they'll, they'll come to class um, much more regularly and they, as you're learning their names and they're getting more comfortable, um, you, sh you can share some things about yourself what you're comfortable with sharing, and they can share some things about themselves. It's a very gradual process, but what you see is this, they become more comfortable, they become more relaxed, they connect with others in the class, and that's really important in terms of their success. First, they have to feel like, you know, there's a place for me here in this class, in this, at this university. And those things that you do to help build those connections um, create that strong foundation that is really critical to, to help them be successful in your class and help them have a strong foundation at NIU and help them to graduate. So one of the techniques I use for introductions is I have students introduce another student instead of introducing themselves then, you know, if you introduce yourself, you might kind of come through this semi-memorized, okay, you know, I teach this, or I, I'm interested in this, and, and they're not really thinking about it, but I will have them introduce another student, and usually they don't know these other students, and I'll have some prompts, um, maybe three prompts, and something that's connected with the content of the course, because every instructional strategy that I use in a class is connected with the um, content of the course or, or um, and trying to build that community. Um, but just a simple structure of three prompts takes down their nervousness and they can say, okay, I know what I'm supposed to ask this person. You know, I'm a little uncomfortable introducing a person I don't know, but everybody else has to do it. And so, you know, they get used to this. And I do these techniques um, in every class. And as the semester goes on, they get more comfortable with it. Um, so starting with that foundation of belonging, connecting, and building community is, is really impactful, particularly for first-generation students, because they might not even see themselves in this community of the class or larger community of the university. Next slide, please. Another opportunity for you connecting with the students and for building that communication is to create opportunities to chat with the professor. And I used to make these optional. Um, sometimes I, I make them worth a few points. Um, but the reason that you want to have these opportunities to connect with the professor um, in early in the semester is because you want to show the students that you, you know, they get to kind of know you, that you're open for them to ask questions to, that you're there for support, um, and do this, build these short chats into early in the semester, um, I build them in mid-semester, and then ongoing um, is through office hours. Um, and I've seen that once I've started to make these opportunities to chat with me mandatory or with a few points, I started to see that I could kind of get a sense of the students, they could get a sense of me, um, you know, the expectations, that I really am available to help support them. And they really need support. Those um, kind of making that uh, the culture and navigating the university visible to them. You can do that in these minute, these short meetings. And if you do it early on, you're starting that connection. If you wait too late, then they've already kind of developed their habits in the class. They already kind of have a perception of, of do they think they can contact you and are you open to that and all those kinds of things. So, so I definitely have seen an um, improvement in that um, them asking me questions and things since I started those early and mid-semester check-ins with the students. And the ongoing 
be sure that you explain to students what office hours are. And you might want to change the title of those because students don't necessarily know what those are. And particularly first generation students. So they say, you know, they read, okay, that's office hours. So that might mean to them that that's when you're in your office working. So they might not realize that that's an opportunity that they can come in and meet with you. So you might change the name, you know, opportunities to um, talk with the professor or whatever, so that it's more clear and it's a little more humanized. And it, then they know that they can come in and talk to you because we have had students say that they thought that was the time that the professor was working and that they weren't supposed to bother them. So keep that in mind. Next slide, please. And another thing that I do to bring alive the, the Blackboard course and to connect with students, make them feel welcome, is for every course in Blackboard, so I have Blackboard as a, a, a shell or structure for every course, whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid, online, I'll have an introduction of the course, of myself, and in that, I'll say, you know, these are the reasons why I'm excited about, about um, this, this class. These are the ways that I am um, available to help you. I'm excited to help you. I want you to be successful. And say those things that are going to help them see, oh, you know, I'm looking at this Blackboard course. The course starts next week. I can see the professor. You know, I can see that, um, you know, these are the main um, things to be aware of for the class. Um, you know, she seems personable, so I feel, oh, you know, I could probably get a hold of her on Teams or something and ask a question. And so this video welcomes them to the class before they've even met you. You can have it open before the semester starts. And because, you know, there's always those students who get online early and they really want to be ready. And so you can kind of calm down those um, nerves and let them see you and um, get to know you a little bit. Next slide, please. And then for each week, I will have a short video. And again, it's to humanize that course. So you have students looking at the material, looking at what are the topics for the week. And, you know, maybe I'll highlight, I'll highlight the the main points about the course that week, but also some things about campus. This would be an opportunity where you could um, talk about things happening on campus. Maybe it's a week of wel welcome or it's homecoming week, or there's something going on in downtown DeKalb, or there's some kind of online events. We have events um, for all students. And so again, that's an opportunity for you to show that you're humanizing the course. You know, the professor is a live, breathing, kind human person. And there's also other aspects of um, that are related to the course, but another part of their college experience, like STEM Fest is coming up. You could throw that in when you have the, um, after you've talked about the uh, week and the modules and stuff like that. So the good thing about putting these in Blackboard is that they can look at it at their own, um, whatever works for their time schedule. It's persistent material. So, you know, they can see, oh yeah, you know, um, professors in there. Um, and it shows them that you are really trying to connect with them. And that's really important um, to keeping them in, in class in school and helping them to be successful and graduate. Next slide, please. And then the growth mindset is important. And just to summarize growth mindset, it's where with a person believes that with work and with um, learning that they can improve their knowledge and proficiency related to certain content, skills, et cetera. So we want to set up, um, and that's compared to a fixed mindset that 
thinks, okay, I was born with this intellectual ability and that's all I have. Um, so I can't learn that. And so that's what, that's not what we're about in college. We are about growth mindset. We're about helping to set up a successful learning environment and supportive learning environment for students so that wherever they're starting with the content knowledge and their knowledge of NIU and higher education, we can help them to move forward and they can develop their ability. Um, and it's not, um, their success is not due to some innate characteristics that they had when they were born. Um, we want to show them that with work, then that their competence can be improved and that applying effort and seeking feedback, that's where those um, ongoing discussions with students, you can give them uh, formative feedback and then they can see that, oh, you know, I can um, take this information and apply it and I'll be more successful on the next um, test or the next assignment. Um, and you can bring in examples of how you as a learner became more proficient and were successful applying this hard work and ongoing effort. And sometimes I think that uh, students, they, and sometimes we probably forget, you know, how much effort we put in to get to this level of knowledge and expertise. It took a lot of effort. Um, and that's great. So we need to show people that that effort um, and the feedback and the continuous improvement is something that each student, um, no matter where they're starting, can continue to progress and improve. And so that's growth mindset. Okay, um, next slide, please. And normalize seeking help. That's really important because um, People can be hesitant to ask questions, and we want to create a, a classroom environment where students feel comfortable asking questions and understand that learning involves struggling and it involves iterations of getting better um, and gaining more knowledge. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. And Lynn had mentioned some of the um, NIU resources. We have extensive resources at NIU to support our students, and I'm very proud of those. Um, our student success centers and um, our library, and we have resources in our links that we'll be sharing with you all. So show them that you're there to help them and that you want them to ask questions. And when they ask questions in class, then say, you know, thank you for that question. That's an important point to think about. And here's how we can address that. And also there's um, one of our colleagues, Kim Schatz, Kimberly Shatik had done a library scavenger hunt that I found very valuable for my um, UNIV 101 students, because a number of them said that they had never been to the library in their entire life. And so I um, had her do one of these library uh, scavenger hunts for the class, and, and the students said it was really valuable. So make sure that they understand. They're not on their own, that other students and you and the NIU resources are there to help them. Next slide, please. And then universal design for learning is the idea that we design the course from the very beginning so that it supports all of the different needs of students. So we use multiple formats for the course. We'll have video, we'll have audio, we'll have um, text, we'll have all of these different modalities so that students can choose how to, um, which modality, um, fits with their preferences. And so that when you use these in universal design for learning principles, you don't have to go back and adapt the course later because you've designed it so that it's open and supports all of the learners. Um, and there's a whole um, separate session on that, but it's really something to think about in terms of um, meeting the needs of, of all of the learners. Next slide, please. 
Um, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Wynn for her discussion. So um, I want to um, spend a few last minutes to talk about the importance of mentorship, um, research mentorship, as well as peer mentorship. So um, <clears throat> um, guidance and support in navigating um, the complex system of higher education is, is crucial. And I, I want to share another anecdote story. So, um, as a grad student, I make 21,000 something um, a year, 20 years ago. And I will actually make more money than my entire family. So after paying my share of local federal taxes, on that 21,000 something income, I was still able to pay for my two brothers' education and therefore change the trajectory of their lives and family life. So um, not only I helped my family, I contributed to the economy um, and that what public education about, right? For to get out of poverty and allow them to contribute to our economy and society. Take a lot of hard work um, to get there, and um, it take for me it take one chemistry professor to ask this question: Have you ever considered graduate school? That was the question that changed my life, and it take the professor to be patient and understanding um, to to take the question: What a graduate school seriously, and provide guidance and support. Because when he asked me, have you ever considered graduate school? I responded, what is graduate school? Because I had no idea. So that research mentor helped me apply for graduate school. Um, his name was Professor Richard Taylor. He passed away but uh, because of him um, and his guidance and support um, that I were to the PhD and that changed my life. So NIU offer research rookies. It's a program that provides undergraduate students, regardless of major, an opportunity to explore their research interests while gaining knowledge and practical skill needed to, to study effectively. So um, if you have not heard about research rookie, please look it up um, and um, share the information with you. Student, especially if you're teaching gateway courses, general education courses, and you get to interact with a lot of students or newly transfer students, please tell them about research rookie, encourage them to apply and help. Um, throughout my undergraduate and graduate years, I didn't have a role model. I felt very alone in my experience. Um, I didn't know how to get. Um, and 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 like I shared earlier, I don't need resources. So um, one of the things Yvonne shared earlier, building a learning community class. So if you can have an activity, like Yvonne say, for them to introduce themselves, get to know themselves, make connection early, um, that can help provide them opportunity to build peer mentorship. Um, if you can incorporate group assignment or collaborate work in your courses to help students meaningful connection uh, and friendship. Um, I realize we're running out of time, so I'm going to go through these really quickly. Um, um, we have a lot of resources here at NIU, so this link I use to toolkit how to provide scaffold to support. And once again, we will share all. Uh, I want to take the last minute to highlight the support um, resources center. Um, we have a lot of term of uh, services. Um, <clears throat> we have an entire website dedicated and they break down the different academic um, uh, 
I don't know if you can see the slide, something just happened, but um, basically at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, we my one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, on teaching practice, shop and program, teaching practice, AI and technology. Check out our website and here and let Yvonne, can you still see the slide? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because my screen just blanked out. Okay. So that's the last um, screen. So it looks good, Lynn. So, um, yeah, we're going to be here for a few minutes. If you have any questions after that, now, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, that. everybody. We appreciate you coming. Thank you.